Welcome back, everyone. Um, in these next two videos, I'm going to be talking about Kant's understanding of the nature of the goodwill and how this relates to the categorical imperative. And um, I thought about doing this in just one video, but um, I think that video would get a little too long. Uh, I know my last video was 26 minutes and it took me forever to save it and upload it on YouTube. So I'll try to keep these decks to uh, a little shorter. All right. Now, so when we're talking about um, the nature of the goodwill, Kant says that there is nothing good besides having a goodwill. So uh, being a person of goodwill is fundamentally good. It is the only thing which is intrinsically valuable. So Kant does not deny that things like happiness and, and pleasure uh, are good things. They are good things, but they are kind of good in a secondary sort of sense. So to say that happiness is a good thing for Kant already presupposes that the individual who is happy deserves to be happy or is entitled to their happiness. But if we're talking about whether or not an individual deserves to be happy or is kind of entitled to their happiness, um, that already presupposes that an individual is a person of goodwill. If we're talking about the right to be happy, um, you can only have the right to be happy if you already are a person of goodwill. So if the utilitarian is going to say, well, happiness is intrinsically valuable, Kant says, aha, I've got you there because um, if happiness is valuable, it's only valuable to the goodwilled individual. All right. Now, but what do we mean by a good will here? Um, a good will for Kant is a will that is entirely motivated by rational duty or law, uh, regardless of other inclinations. So to be a person of good will largely involves your ability to act in accordance rationally in accordance with a law, a mandate of reason, or a duty, even if you really don't want to, um, even if you think that you might actually be better off as far as pleasure goes doing something else. So the person of goodwill is the individual who is not ruled primarily by desire or influence. Now, the reason why this is important with respect to uh, whether or not our actions are right, and even with respect to our moral decision-making is this. Um, Kant thinks that it is not enough to merely conform to what is right. So it, it's not enough for your actions to just conform to what is right or wrong. Your actions need to be done for the sake of what is right or wrong. So merely conforming to what is moral is not nearly enough. Your action needs to be done for the sake of what is moral. Um, now, when your action just merely conforms to what is right, the object behind or the goal behind your action could be something other than the fact that it is right. Um, so Kant uses the example of a, a shopkeeper who you know, charges his customers fair prices, but not out of any sort of concern for the customers. It's it's primarily out of selfish benefit. The shopkeeper thinks, okay, well, if I charge unfair prices, um, I'm going to lose customers, or I will look bad, or you know, think of politicians that volunteer their time at soup kitchens and and kiss babies and things like that. Um, I think a lot of these individuals would not be doing so if they weren't running for public office. I mean, so if the motivation here is, you know what, I'm, I'm going to appear to have goodwill towards others just to increase my public persona, um, this would be an example of just conforming to what is right. Or if when I was a kid, um, there was an instance where my, my mom told me, well, she asked me if I could do the dishes, and I was sitting there on the couch contemplating whether or not to do what my mother said or just stay on the couch. And I finally decided, you know what, it'll probably be better for me if I get up off this couch and go and do the dishes. Um, why? Because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to get yelled at. I don't want to get grounded or sent to my room. 
And all of those things will likely happen to me if I don't do what mom told me to do. Uh, so I decided to get up off of the couch, but I, I didn't decide to get off the couch for the sake of doing what is right. Um, I decided to get off of the couch just to avoid getting punished. Um, so it's funny when in class situations where a question comes up, okay, well, why is murder morally wrong? And, you know, somebody will say, well, you'll go to jail. And it's like, n n no, the fact that you might go to jail, that doesn't explain why murder is wrong. We, we put people in jail for murder because murder is wrong. So, I mean, if the only reason why you're not murdering people is to avoid jail time, I think that's a pretty clear indication that you're not a person of goodwill. So that's why mere conformity is not enough. So Kant puts it this way. He says, if, if our goal is just simply to conform to the moral law or to what is right, he, he says our, our will is too precarious or contingent. He says, simply trying to conform to what is right will sometimes produce actions which are in line with what is moral, but other times it will produce actions which are completely the opposite of what is moral. So if my primary motivation for action is just avoiding punishment, sometimes that motivation is not going to be enough to get me to do, uh, to get me to do the right thing. So if uh, on a completely different day, my mom asks me to do the dishes and I think to myself, you know what? I really don't care about getting punished. Um, I might sit on the couch and say, no, I'm not doing the dishes. Well, I'm going to ground you. Okay, do your worst. Send me to my room. Take away my CDs, whatever the case may be. I, I don't care. Um, not doing the dishes and getting punished for it, that, that is what I want, right? Or not doing the dishes and getting punished for it, that's that's what I really want right now. So trying to avoid punishment or trying to look well, you know, to, to increase my public persona in other people's eyes, that's not going to be a strong enough motivation to do what is right. Now, but if I make the object behind my action uh, just simply doing the right thing because it is right, then Kant thinks that this can actually serve as a guiding thread for moral behavior. So if I'm motivated to act in a way um, you know, to do the right thing for any other reason than that it is right, Kant thinks that I've actually done the wrong thing. So doing the, the quote-unquote right thing for the wrong reason is just as bad as doing, you know, just blatantly doing the wrong thing. Okay, now, and furthermore, the reason why this is the case is because our desires and our intentions can be determined by things that are outside of our control. Uh, we do not have, psychologically, we do not have complete control over our desires and over our intentions. Um, we may be able to indirectly shape our desires and our intentions, but we cannot, just through an act of will alone, change our desires. So, for example, uh, if you're on a diet, and of course when you're on a diet, you want all the things that you're not supposed to have because of your diet, you might be able to will yourself to resist those desires. So, you know, when you're, when all you're doing is eating kale all day and all you want is a donut, you might be able to will yourself to resist the donut, but you can't will yourself to not want the donut. There's a big difference there. So if I'm on a diet and I'm staring at donuts at the grocery store, I can't through an act of will alone make myself no longer want a donut and change my desire to wanting kale or wanting something that will, you know, actually corresponds with my diet. So I can still resist the donut potentially, but resisting the donut still involves me wanting the donut. You can't resist something that you don't want. If somebody offers me something that I don't want, I'm not resisting it by saying, no, thank you. The, the very notion of resistance implies want. So you can indirectly shape your desires. So maybe eventually after eating kale for a long time, I'll actually start to like it. 
But man, when I first go on a diet or when you first start an exercise regimen, you're going to hate it. But then eventually over time, just by habitually engaging in certain kinds of activities, you can indirectly change your desires. Uh, now, so you can't directly change your desires or your intentions, but you can indirectly shape them. Now, but since your desires and your intentions are not the kinds of things that you have direct control over, and for Kant, moral responsibility and moral blame and praise involves this notion of control, uh, simply desiring to do what is right or simply intending to do what is right is not good enough. It is not, a, not good enough to desire the right or to intend the right because you could desire it for some other reason than that it is right. You could intend it for some other reason than that it is right. So desire and intention is not enough. You have to will yourself to do what is right. You have to will yourself to do the right thing, even when all of your other inclinations, your desires and your intentions uh, are pointing you towards doing the wrong thing. Okay, so here's kind of a comical uh, story which will illustrate this. Uh, I call it the tale of the two nurses. Okay, so here is nurse number one. Nurse number one is the joyful nurse. So you're in the hospital recovering from uh, surgery and joyful nurse is going to be your nurse uh, for the day. So you're going to be spending two days in the hospital. So throughout the day, joyful nurse comes in to check on you and is very congenial smiles, has really good bedside manner and those kinds of things. And your time spent with joyful nurse is a really enjoyable experience. Uh, you know, lots of pleases and thank yous and you're welcome and just a very sort of cheerful disposition about them. And uh, joyful nurse comes in at the end of their shift and they say, uh, okay, I'm, I'm done. I will be back here at 6 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, you know, I've got the same shift with you tomorrow. And uh, as they're leaving, you say, I just want to say thank you so much for, you know, uh, being my nurse today. I, I really enjoyed having you. And Joyful Nurse says, oh, it's no problem at all. I, I really love working with patients. It gives me, you know, happiness and pleasure and things like that to work with people like you. So I, I don't consider my job a burden at all. I really love my job. Um, and let's say that I'm visiting you in the hospital. I don't know why. Maybe I just want to get out of the house for a while. So I'm just hanging out with you in your hospital room. And uh, I kind of get this puzzled look on my face and I, I stop joyful nurse and, and I say, um, hey, a joyful nurse yeah um just just a question w would you say that what motivates you to get out of bed in the morning and go to work is your desire to work with patients and the you know the the sense of satisfaction that you get out of your job a joyful nurse says oh yes absolutely it is it is my desire and and my the satisfaction that i get out of doing this job that is what gets me up every morning motivates me to to get out of bed and and go to my job. And I sort of go, okay, all right, all right. So here's what happens. Um, after Joyful Nurse leaves your room, they go to the parking garage and uh, they have a flat tire. Uh, and then uh, they change their tire, they get home and the power's out and all the food in their refrigerator is spoiled. There's a note from their partner on the kitchen table which says uh, i'm leaving you and i'm taking the cat and uh on top of all of this they're out of whiskey so spoiled food powers out had to change a flat tire partner has left them and no longer they have a cat so uh, joyful nurse falls into the depths of despair and spends the night drinking and commiserating and crying um and then the next morning their alarm goes off at 4 a.m. Uh, so that they can get out of bed and go to work. And everything within them just wants to call in sick and stay in bed. And uh, they're actually out of sick time. They can't actually afford to call in sick. But every all of their desires and inclinations are, you know what? Screw it. I don't care about my patients. Uh, I hope they all die today. I hate my job, I hate my life, there's no way in hell I am going to work today. 
So joyful nurse gets on the phone and calls in sick, says, I'm not coming into work today. And this second nurse is responsible for taking over joyful nurse's shift. And this is begrudging nurse. So begrudging nurse gets a phone call at 4.30 in the morning and it's their day off. It's supposed to be their day off. Uh, but their supervisor calls in and says, hey, joyful nurse can't come to work today. We need you to take over their shift. And keep in mind, I know it's your day off, but keep in mind, it's a, it's a condition of your employment. You agreed to be on call even on your days off when we are shorthanded. And this is one of those days. So begrudging nurse gets off the phone and is incredibly annoyed. They planned on doing something fun that day or just hanging around the house that day or whatever. Everything within them does not want to go to work. They are inclined to say, okay, well then I will get a new job. I don't want to go to work today. I want to stay in bed. I want to do my own thing, yada, yada, yada. But then they think to themselves, yes, I did agree to be on call in the event that the hospital is short-staffed. That is what I freely consented to as a condition of my employment. So I am obligated to get up and go to work. So they will themselves to get out of bed and go to work. And guess which nurse you have today. Today you have begrudging nurse. Yeah, they don't look too happy. So um, begrudging nurse, since they don't want to be there that day, they don't have exactly the same sort of uh, cheerful disposition that joyful nurse had. Um, when you ask begrudging nurse for something, you know, an extra pillow or a glass of water, they kind of just sigh and bring it to you. And then anything else, you know, uh, you can tell that they're annoyed. You can tell that they're grumpy and they don't really want to be there, but they're still doing everything that they're required. To do you know they're not suffocating you with a pillow or anything like that um so then at the end of the day begrudging nurse comes in and says all right my shift is over um joyful nurse is supposed to be back tomorrow but for all i know i'll be back tomorrow filling in for them uh tomorrow's supposed to be my day off again but hey i might see you again tomorrow and uh you sort of say uh thanks and can i just say it wasn't really an enjoyable experience having you here and begrudging nurse says okay well i don't know what to tell you and you say well if, if you don't want to be here then why are you here did you want to be here today and begrudging nurse says no i didn't want to be here today this was supposed to be my day off i had plans so no i didn't want to be here today and you say, well, if you didn't want to be here, then why are you here? And begrudging nurse says, because that's what's required of me. I am here. I was here today because that is what I'm required to do. I was here today out of a sense of duty. Okay, now here's the question, though. Between begrudging nurse and joyful nurse, which nurse would you like? Would you like to spend the day with joyful nurse? Or would you like to spend the day with begrudging nurse? Now, I think most of you would probably want to spend your day with joyful nurse because that would be a much more pleasant experience. It clearly would. It clearly would be a much uh, more pleasurable experience or a happier experience to be with joyful nurse than to be with begrudging nurse. But here is the problem. Between joyful nurse and begrudging nurse, which one can actually be trusted to do what is required of them? So you might enjoy being with joyful nurse for the day more than you would being with begrudging nurse for the day. But between joyful nurse and begrudging nurse, which one of them can you actually trust to do what is right by you? Can you really trust joyful nurse? who is primarily ruled, if you will, by desire and inclination rather than their will. They're primarily ruled by their desires and their intentions and other inclinations over which they really exercise no direct control. They're entirely ruled by that. 
Or would you rather have begrudging nurse who you can trust to do what is right by you, regardless of how they are feeling that day? You don't need to worry about begrudging nurse really suffocating you with a pillow. You need to worry about joyful nurse suffocating you with a pillow. So this is going to sound incredibly harsh. I do not trust people that are happy all the time. I really don't. I, I really do not trust people that are happy all the time because I think that's really disingenuous. And this is Kant's point. Begrudging nurse can be trusted because they are motivated by their sense of duty. They're motivated by their will to do what is right, even if they don't really want to do it. This is not the case with joyful nurse. But a lot of times we get the equation backwards. Um, between the two individuals, joyful nurse and begrudging nurse, I think most individuals would want to heap praise upon joyful nurse. When somebody loves their job, when somebody loves doing the right thing, we say, oh, well, that's great. You're a great person. And then when someone begrudgingly does the right thing, we sort of go, oh, well, phew. but isn't it the other way around? Now, why is it the other way around? Why is it that begrudging nurse might deserve your moral praise more than joyful nurse does? Well, think about it this way. How hard is it to do what you want to do? How difficult is it to do what you want to do? It's not difficult at all to do what you want to do. So if joyful nurse is getting up and going to work because that's the strongest desire that they have, why would you heap praise upon joyful nurse? You shouldn't. They're doing what they want. You should heap praise on begrudging nurse. They're the one that's in the much more difficult position. They're the one that is willing themselves to do what is right, even though their strongest desire and inclination at the time runs contrary to that. It's begrudging nurse, Kant thinks, who really deserves our moral praise and our moral appreciation more than joyful nurse. But yeah, I agree with you. I would rather spend time with joyful nurse as well in kind of in a non-professional capacity. But man, if, if I want somebody who needs to take care of me, I would much rather have begrudging nurse because I can actually trust them to do what's required of them. All right. Okay. In the next video, we'll be talking specifically about the categorical imperative and how this sense of will relates. I'll see you then.